Good evening, and thank you for joining me for another Boring Books for Bedtime. I hope tonight's selection provides all the boredom your busy brain needs to quiet down and let you get some sleep. So find a comfortable spot, adjust your volume, take a nice deep breath in, let it out slowly, and off we go. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that we're in a three-part series, at the end of which, everyone who supports this podcast in October will be receiving a complete recording of this book. That's three hours of relaxation without interruption, and I hope you enjoy it. If you're interested in supporting us and receiving this gift in your Halloween pumpkin this year, you'll find links to Patreon and buymeacoffee.com in the show description. And I'd like to give a special shout-out of thanks to everyone who's done so so far. Your help makes this podcast possible and helps keep it ad-free for everyone, and it's much appreciated. Now, let's get to the reading. Tonight we're relaxing with Part 2 of Edinburgh, Picturesque Notes, by Robert Louis Stevenson. First published in 1878, and republished in 1903 by Seely & Co. Limited, 38 Great Russell Street, London. Let's pick up where we left off. Chapter 4. Legends. The character of a place is often most perfectly expressed in its associations. An event strikes root and grows into a legend when it has happened amongst congenial surroundings. Ugly actions, above all in ugly places, have the true romantic quality and become an undying property of their scene. To a man like Sir Walter Scott, the different appearances of nature seemed each to contain its own legend ready-made, which it was his to call forth. In such or such a place, only such or such events ought with propriety to happen, and in this spirit he made the Lady of the Lake for Benvenue, the Heart of Midlothian for Edinburgh, and the pirate, so indifferently written, but so romantically conceived, for the desolate islands and roaring tideways of the north. The common run of mankind have, from generation to generation, an instinct almost as delicate as that of Scott. But where he created new things, they only forgot what is unsuitable among the old, and by survival of the fittest, a body of tradition becomes a work of art. So, in the low dens and high-flying garrets of Edinburgh, people may go back upon dark passages in the town's adventures and chill their marrow with winter's tales about the fire, tales that are singularly apposite and characteristic not only of the old life, but of the very constitution of built nature in that part, and singularly well qualified to add horror to horror when the wind pipes around the tall lands and hoots adown arched passageways, and the far-spread wilderness of city lamps keeps quavering and flaring in the gusts. Here it is the tale of Begbie the bank porter, stricken to the heart at a blow, and left in his blood within a step or two of the crowded high street. There people hush their voices over burke and hair, over drugs and violated graves, and the resurrection men smothering their victims with their knees. Here again the fame of Deacon Brody is kept piously fresh. A great man in his day was the deacon, well seen in good society, crafty with his hands as a cabinet maker, and one who could sing a song with taste. 
many a citizen was proud to welcome the deacon to supper, and dismissed him with regret at a timious hour, who would have been vastly disconcerted had he known how soon and in what guise his visitor returned. Many stories are told of this redoubtable Edinburgh burglar, but the one I have in my mind most vividly gives the key of all the rest. A friend of Brodie's, nested some way towards heaven in one of these great lands, had told him of a projected visit to the country, and afterwards, detained by some affairs, put it off and stayed the night in town. The good man had lain some time awake. It was far on in the small hours by the Tron Bell, when suddenly there came a creak, a jar, a faint light. Softly he clambered out of bed and up to a false window, which looked upon another room, and there, by the glimmer of a thieves' lantern, was his good friend the deacon in a mask. It is characteristic of the town and the town's manners that this little episode should have been quietly tided over, and quite a good time elapsed before a great robbery, an escape, a Bow Street runner, a cockfight, an apprehension in a cupboard in Amsterdam, and a last step into the air off his own greatly improved gallows drop brought the career of Deacon William Brodie to an end. But still, by the mind's eye, he may be seen, a man harassed below a mountain of duplicity, slinking from a magistrate's supper-room to a thieves' ken, and pickering among the closes by the flicker of a dark lamp. Or where the deacon is out of favor, Perhaps some memory lingers of the great plagues, and of fatal houses still unsafe to enter within the memory of man. For in time of pestilence, the discipline had been sharp and sudden, and what we now call stamping out contagion was carried on with deadly rigor. The officials, in their gowns of grey, with a white St. Andrew's cross on back and breast, and a white cloth carried before them on a staff, perambulated the city, adding the terror of man's justice to the fear of God's visitation. The dead they buried on the borough muir. The living who had concealed the sickness were drowned, if they were women, in the quarry holes and if they were men, were hanged and gibbeted at their own doors. And wherever the evil had passed, furniture was destroyed and houses closed. And the most bogeyish part of the story is about such houses. Two generations back, they still stood dark and empty. People avoided them as they passed by. The boldest schoolboy only shouted through the keyhole and made off, for within it was supposed the plague lay ambushed like a basilisk, ready to flow forth and spread blame and pustule through the city. What a terrible next-door neighbor for superstitious citizens! A rat scampering within would send a shudder through the stoutest heart. Here, if you like, was a sanitary parable, addressed by our uncleanly forefathers to their own neglect. And then we have Major Weir, for although even his house is now demolished, old Edinburgh cannot clear herself of his unholy memory. He and his sister lived together in an odor of sour piety. She was a marvelous spinster. He had a rare gift of supplication and was known among devout admirers by the name of Angelical Thomas. He was a tall, black man and ordinarily looked down to the ground, 
a grim countenance and a big nose. His garb was still a cloak and somewhat dark, and he never went without his staff. How it came about that Angelical Thomas was burned in company with his staff, and his sister in gentler manner hanged, and whether these two were simply religious maniacs of a more furious order, or had real as well as imaginary sins upon their old-world shoulders, are points happily beyond the reach of our intention. At least it is suitable enough that out of this superstitious city some such example should have been put forth, the outcome and fine flower of dark and vehement religion. And at least the facts struck the public fancy and brought forth a remarkable family of myths. It would appear that the major's staff went upon his errands and even ran before him with a lantern on dark nights. Gigantic females, stentoriously laughing and gaping with teehees of laughter at unseasonable hours of night and morning, haunted the purlieus of his abode. His house fell under such a load of infamy that no one dared to sleep in it until municipal improvement leveled the structure to the ground. And my father has often been told in the nursery how the devil's coach, drawn by six coal-black horses with fiery eyes, would drive at night into the West Bow, and belated people might see the dead major through the glasses. Another legend is that of the two maiden sisters. A legend, I am afraid it may be, in the most discreditable meaning of the term, or perhaps something worse, a mere yesterday's fiction, but it is a story of some vitality, and is worthy of a place in the Edinburgh calendar. This pair inhabited a single room. From the facts, it must have been double-bedded, and it may have been of some dimensions, but when all is said, it was a single room. Here our two spinsters fell out, on some point of controversial divinity belike, but fell out so bitterly that there was never a word spoken between them, black or white, from that day forward. You would have thought they would separate, but no. Whether from lack of means or the Scottish fear of scandal, they continued to keep house together where they were. A chalk line drawn upon the floor separated their two domains. It bisected the doorway and the fireplace, so that each could go out and in and do her cooking without violating the territory of the other. So for years they coexisted in a hateful silence. Their meals, their ablutions, their friendly visitors, exposed to an unfriendly scrutiny. And at night, in the dark watches, each could hear the breathing of her enemy. Never did four walls look down upon an uglier spectacle than these sisters rivaling in unsisterliness. Here is a canvas for Hawthorne to have turned into a cabinet picture. He had a puritanic vein, which would have fitted him to treat this puritanic horror. He could have shown them to us in their sicknesses and at their hideous twin devotions, thumbing a great pair of Bibles, or praying aloud for each other's penitence with marrowy emphasis. Now each, with kilted petticoat, at her own corner of the fire on some tempestuous evening, now sitting each at her window, looking out upon the summer landscape sloping far below them towards the firth, and the field paths where they had wandered hand in hand. Or, as age and infirmity grew upon them 
and prolonged their toilette, and their hands began to tremble, and their heads to nod involuntarily, growing only the more steeled in enmity with years. Until one fine day, at a word, a look, a visit, or the approach of death, their hearts would melt, and the chalk boundary be overstepped forever. Alas, to those who know the ecclesiastical history of the race, the most perverse and melancholy in man's annals, this will seem only a figure of much that is typical of Scotland and her high-seated capital above the fourth, a figure so grimly realistic that it may pass with strangers for a caricature. We are wonderful, patient haters, for conscience' sake, up here in the North. I spoke in the first of these papers of the parliaments of the established and free churches, and how they can hear each other singing psalms across the street. There is but a street between them in space, but a shadow between them in principle, and yet there they sit, enchanted, and in damnatory accents pray for each other's growth in grace. It would be well if there were no more than two, but the sex in Scotland form a large family of sisters, and the chalk lines are thickly drawn, and run through the midst of many private homes. Edinburgh is a city of churches, as though it were a place of pilgrimage, you will see four within a stone cast at the head of the west bow. Some are crowded to the doors, some are empty like monuments, and yet you will ever find new ones in the building. Hence that surprising clamor of church bells that suddenly breaks out upon the Sabbath morning from Trinity and the sea skirts to Morningside on the borders of the hills. I have heard the chimes of Oxford playing their symphony in a golden autumn morning, and beautiful it was to hear. But in Edinburgh, all manner of loud bells join, or rather disjoin, in one swelling, brutal babblement of noise. Now one overtakes another, and now lags behind it. Now five or six all strike on the pained tympanum at the same punctual instant of time, and make together a dismal chord of discord. And now for a second all seem to have conspired to hold their peace. Indeed, there are not many uproars in this world, more dismal than that of the Sabbath bells in Edinburgh. A harsh ecclesiastical tocsin, the outcry of incongruous orthodoxies, calling on every separate conventicler to put up a protest, each in his own synagogue, against right-hand extremes and left-hand affections. And surely there are few worse extremes than this extremity of zeal, and few more deplorable defections than this disloyalty to Christian love. Shakespeare wrote a comedy of much ado about nothing. The Scottish nation made a fantastic tragedy on the same subject. And it is for the success of this remarkable piece that these bells are sounded every Sabbath morning on the hills above the fourth. How many of them might rest silent in the steeple? How many of these ugly churches might be demolished and turned once more into useful building material if people who think almost exactly the same thoughts about religion would condescend to worship God under the same roof? But there are the chalk lines, and which is to pocket pride and speak the first word. Chapter 5 
Grey Friars. It was Queen Mary who threw open the gardens of the Grey Friars, a new and semi-rural cemetery in those days, although it has grown in antiquity in its turn and been superseded by half a dozen others. The friars must have had a pleasant time on summer evenings, for their gardens were situated to a wish, with the tall castle and the tallest of the castle crags in front. Even now, it is one of our famous Edinburgh points of view, and strangers are led thither to see, by yet another instance, how strangely the city lies upon her hills. The enclosure is of an irregular shape. The double church of old and new grey friars stand on the level at the top. A few thorns are dotted here and there, and the ground falls by terrace and steep slope towards the north. The open shows many slabs and table tombstones, and all round the margin the place is girt by an array of aristocratic mausoleums appallingly adorned. Setting aside the tombs of Rubiliac, which belong to the heroic order of graveyard art, we Scotch stand, to my fancy, highest among nations in the matter of grimly illustrating death. We seem to love for their own sake, the emblems of time and the great change, and even around country churches you will find a wonderful exhibition of skulls and crossbones and noseless angels and trumpets pealing for the judgment day. Every mason was a pedestrian Holbein. He had a deep consciousness of death and loved to put its terrors pithily before the churchyard loiterer. He was brimful of rough hints upon mortality, and any dead farmer was seized upon to be a text. The classical examples of this art are in Greyfriars. In their time, these were doubtless costly monuments, and reckoned of a very elegant proportion by contemporaries. And now, when the elegance is not so apparent, the significance remains. You may perhaps look with a smile on the profusion of Latin mottoes, some crawling endwise up the shaft of a pillar, some issuing on a scroll from angels' trumpets on the emblematic horrors, the figures rising headless from the grave, and all the traditional ingenuities in which it pleased our fathers to set forth their sorrow for the dead and their sense of earthly mutability. But it is not a hearty sort of mirth. Each ornament may have been executed by the merriest apprentice whistling as he plied the mallet, but the original meaning of each, and the combined effect of so many of them in this quiet enclosure, is serious to the point of melancholy. Round a great part of the circuit, houses of a low class present their backs to the churchyard. Only a few inches separate the living from the dead. Here, a window is partly blocked up by the pediment of a tomb. There, where the street falls far below the level of the graves, a chimney has been trained up the back of a monument, and a red pot looks vulgarly over from behind. A damp smell of the graveyard finds its way into houses where workmen sit at meat. Domestic life on a small scale goes forward visibly at the windows. The very solitude and stillness of the enclosure, which lies apart from the town's traffic, serves to accentuate the contrast. As you walk upon the graves, you see children scattering crumbs to feed the sparrows. 
You hear people singing or washing dishes and the sound of tears and castigation. The linen on the clothes pole flaps against funereal sculpture, or perhaps the cat slips over the lintel and descends on a memorial urn. And as there is nothing else astir, these incongruous sights and noises take hold on the attention and exaggerate the sadness of the place. Greyfriars is continually overrun by cats. I have seen one afternoon as many as thirteen of them seated on the grass beside Old Milne, the master builder, all sleek and fat and complacently blinking as if they had fed upon strange meats. Old Milne was chaunting with the saints, as we may hope and cared little for the company about his grave, but I confess the spectacle had an ugly side for me, and I was glad to step forward and raise my eyes to where the castle and the roofs of the old town and the spire of the assembly hall stood deployed against the sky with the colorless precision of engraving. An open outlook is to be desired from a churchyard, and a sight of the sky and some of the world's beauty relieves a mind from morbid thoughts. I shall never forget one visit. It was a grey, dropping day. The grass was strung with raindrops, and the people in the houses kept hanging out their shirts and petticoats and angrily taking them in again as the weather turned from wet to fair and back again. A grave digger and a friend of his, a gardener from the country, accompanied me into one after another of the cells and little courtyards in which it gratified the wealthy of old days to enclose their old bones from neighborhood. In one, under a sort of shrine, we found a forlorn human effigy, very realistically executed, down to the detail of his ribbed stockings, and holding in his hand a ticket with the date of his demise. He looked most pitiful and ridiculous, shut up by himself in his aristocratic precinct, like a bad old boy or an inferior forgotten deity under a new dispensation. The burdocks grew familiarly around his feet. The rain dripped all round him, and the world maintained the most entire indifference as to who he was or whither he had gone. In another, a vaulted tomb, handsome externally, but horrible inside with damp and cobwebs. There were three mounds of black earth and an uncovered thigh bone. This was the place of interment, it appeared, of a family with whom the gardener had been long in service. He was among old acquaintances. This'll be Miss Margaret, said he giving the bone a friendly kick. I have always an uncomfortable feeling in a graveyard, at sight of so many tombs, to perpetuate memories best forgotten. But I never had the impression so strongly as that day. People had been at some expense in both these cases, to provoke a melancholy feeling of derision in the one and an insulting epithet in the other. The proper inscription for the most part of mankind, I began to think, is the cynical cheer, cross TB, that, if anything, will stop the mouth of a carper, since it both admits the worst and carries the war triumphantly into the enemy's camp. Greyfriars is a place of many associations. There was one window in a house at the lower end, now demolished, 
which was pointed out to me by the gravedigger as a spot of legendary interest. Burke, the resurrection man, infamous for so many murders at five shillings a head, used to sit thereat, with pipe and nightcap, to watch burials going forward on the green. In a tomb higher up, which must then have been but newly finished, John Knox, according to the same informant, had taken refuge in a turmoil of the Reformation. Behind the church is the haunted mausoleum of Sir George Mackenzie, Bloody Mackenzie, Lord Advocate in the Covenanting Troubles, and author of some pleasing sentiments on toleration. Here in the last century, an old Harriet's hospital boy once harbored from the pursuit of the police. The hospital is next door to Greyfriars, a courtly building among lawns, where on Founder's Day you may see a multitude of children playing kiss in the ring and round the mulberry bush. Thus, when the fugitive had managed to conceal himself in the tomb, his old schoolmates had a hundred opportunities to bring him food. And there he lay in safety, till a ship was found to smuggle him abroad. But his must have been indeed a heart of brass, to lie all day and night alone with the dead persecutor. And other lads were far from emulating him in courage. When a man's soul is certainly in hell, his body will scarce lie quiet in a tomb, however costly. Some time or other the door must open, and the reprobate come forth in the abhorred garments of the grave. It was thought a high piece of prowess to knock at the Lord Advocate's mausoleum and challenge him to appear. Bloody Mackenzie, come out if you dare, sang the foolhardy urchins. But Sir George had other affairs on hand, and the author of an essay on toleration continues to sleep peacefully among the many whom he so intolerantly helped to slay. For this in Felix Campus, as it is dubbed in one of its own inscriptions, an inscription over which Dr. Johnson passed a critical eye, is in many ways sacred to the memory of the men whom Mackenzie persecuted. It was here on the flat tombstones that the covenant was signed by an enthusiastic people. In the long arm of the churchyard that extends to Lauriston, the prisoners from Bothell Bridge, fed on bread and water, and guarded life for life by vigilant marksmen, lay five months looking for the scaffold or the plantations. And while the good work was going forward in the grass market, idlers in Greyfriars might have heard the throb of the military drums that drowned the voices of the martyrs. Nor is this all, for down in the corner farthest from Sir George, there stands a monument dedicated in uncouth covenanting verse to all who lost their lives in that contention. There is no moorsman shot in a snow shower beside Iron Grey or Comanel. There is not one of the two hundred who were drowned off the Orkneys, nor so much as a poor, overdriven, covenanting slave in the American plantation, but can lay claim to a share in that memorial, and if such things interest just men among the shades, can boast he has a monument on earth, as well as Julius Caesar or the pharaohs. So long as men do their duty, even if it be greatly in a misapprehension, they will be leading pattern lives. And whether or not they come to lie beside a martyr's monument, we may be sure they will find a safe haven somewhere in the providence of God. 
It is not well to think of death, unless we temper the thought with that of heroes who despised it. Upon what ground is of small account. If it be only the bishop who was burned for his faith in the Antipodes, his memory lightens the heart and makes us walk undisturbed among graves. And so the martyr's monument is a wholesome, heartsome spot in the field of the dead. And as we look upon it, a brave influence comes to us from the land of those who have won their discharge, and in another phrase of Patrick Walker's, got cleanly off the stage. Chapter 6 New Town and Town and Country It is as much a matter of course to decry the new town as to exalt the old, and the most celebrated authorities have picked out this quarter as the very emblem of what is condemnable in architecture. Much may be said, much indeed has been said upon the text. But to the unsophisticated, who call anything pleasing if it only pleases them, the new town of Edinburgh seems in itself not only gay and airy, but highly picturesque. An old skipper, invincibly ignorant of all theories of the sublime and beautiful, once propounded as his most radiant notion for paradise, the new town of Edinburgh, with the wind a matter of a point free. He has now gone to that sphere where all good tars are promised pleasant weather in the song, and perhaps his thoughts fly somewhat higher, but there are bright and temperate days, with soft air coming from the inland hills, military music sounding bravely from the hollow of the gardens, the flags all waving on the palaces of Prince's Street, when I have seen the town through a sort of glory and shaken hands in sentiment with the old sailor. And indeed, for a man who has been much tumbled round Orcadian skerries, what scene could be more agreeable to witness? On such a day, the valley wears a surprising air of festival. It seems, I do not know how else to put my meaning, as if it were a trifle too good to be true. It is what Paris ought to be. It has the scenic quality that would best set off a life of unthinking, open-air diversion. It was meant by nature for the realization of the Society of Comic Operas. And you can imagine, if the climate were but towardly, how all the world and his wife would flock into these gardens in the cool of the evening to hear cheerful music to sip pleasant drinks, to see the moon rise from behind Arthur's seat and shine upon the spires and monuments and the green treetops in the valley. Alas, and the next morning the rain is splashing on the windows and the passengers flee along Prince's Street before the galloping squall. It cannot be denied that the original design was faulty and short-sighted, and did not fully profit by the capabilities of the situation. The architect was essentially a town bird, and he laid out the modern city with a view to street scenery, and to street scenery alone. The country did not enter into his plan, he had never lifted his eyes to the hills. If he had so chosen, every street upon the northern slope might have been a noble terrace and commanded an extensive and beautiful view. But the space has been too closely built. Many of the houses front the wrong way 
intent like the man with the muckrake on what is not worth observation and standing discourteously back foremost in the ranks. And in a word, it is too often only from attic windows, or here and there at a crossing, that you can get a look beyond the city upon its diversified surrounding. But perhaps it is all the more surprising to come suddenly on a corner and see a perspective of a mile or more of falling street, and beyond that woods and villas, and a blue arm of sea, and the hills upon the farther side. Ferguson, our Edinburgh poet, Burns's model, once saw a butterfly at the town cross, and the sight inspired him with a worthless little ode. This painted country man, the dandy of the rose garden, looked far abroad in such a humming neighborhood, and you can fancy what moral considerations a youthful poet would supply. But the incident, in a fanciful sort of way, is characteristic of the place. Into no other city does the sight of the country enter so far. If you do not meet a butterfly, you shall certainly catch a glimpse of faraway trees upon your walk, and the place is full of theatre tricks in the way of scenery. You peep under an arch, you descend stairs that look as if they would land you in a cellar, you turn to the back window of a grimy tenement in a lane, and behold, you are face to face with distant and bright prospects. You turn a corner, and there is the sun going down into the highland hills. You look down an alley and see ships tacking for the Baltic. For the country people to see Edinburgh on her hilltops is one thing. It is another for the citizen from the thick of his affairs, to overlook the country. It should be a genial and ameliorating influence in life. It should prompt good thoughts and remind him of nature's unconcern that he can watch from day to day as he trots officeward how the spring green brightens in the wood or the field grows black under a moving plowshare. I have been tempted in this connection to deplore the slender faculties of the human race with its penny whistle of a voice, its dull cars, and its narrow range of sight. If you could see as people are to see in heaven, if you had eyes such as you can fancy for a superior race, if you could take clear note of the objects of vision, not only a few yards, but a few miles from where you stand, think how agreeably your sight would be entertained, how pleasantly your thoughts would be diversified as you walked the Edinburgh streets. For you might pause in some business perplexity in the midst of the city traffic, and perhaps catch the eye of a shepherd as he sat down to breathe upon a heathery shoulder of the Pentlands, or perhaps some urchin clambering in a country elm would put aside the leaves and show you his flushed and rustic visage, or a fisher racing seawards with the tiller under his elbow and the sail sounding in the wind would fling you a salutation from between Anster and the May. To be old is not the same thing as to be picturesque, nor because the old town bears a strange physiognomy does it at all follow that the new town should look commonplace. Indeed, apart from antique houses, it is curious how much description would apply commonly to either. 
the same sudden accidents of ground, a similar dominating sight above the plain, and the same superposition of one rank of society over another are to be observed in both. Thus the broad and comely approach to Prince's Street from the east, lined with hotels and public offices, makes a leap over the gorge of the low Calton. If you cast a glance over the parapet, you look direct into that sunless and disreputable confluent of Leith Street, and the same tall houses open upon both thoroughfares. This is only the new town passing overhead, above its own cellars, walking, so to speak, over its own children, as is the way of cities and the human race. But at the Dean Bridge you may behold a spectacle of a more novel order. The river runs at the bottom of a deep valley, among rocks and between gardens, the crest of either bank is occupied by some of the most commodious streets and crescents in the modern city, and a handsome bridge unites the two summits. Over this, every afternoon, private carriages go spinning by, and ladies with card cases pass to and fro about the duties of society. And yet down below, you may still see, with its mills and foaming weir, the little rural village of Dean. Modern improvement has gone overhead on its high-level viaduct, and the extended city has cleanly overlapped and left unaltered what was once the summer retreat of its comfortable citizens. Every town embraces hamlets in its growth. Edinburgh herself has embraced a good few. But it is strange to see one still surviving, and to see it some hundreds of feet below your path. Is it Torre del Greco that has built above buried Herculaneum? Herculaneum was dead at least, but the sun still shines upon the roofs of Dean. The smoke still rises thriftily from its chimneys. The dusty miller comes to his door, looks at the gurgling water, hearkens to the turning wheel and the birds about his shed, and perhaps whistles an air of his own to enrich the symphony. For all the world as if Edinburgh were still the old Edinburgh on the castle hill, and Dean were still the quietest of hamlets, buried a mile or so in the green country. It is not so long ago since magisterial David Hume lent the authority of his example to the exodus from the old town, and took up his new abode in a street which is still, so oddly may a jest become perpetuated, known as St. David Street. Nor is the town so large, but a holiday schoolboy may harry a bird's nest within half a mile of his own door. There are places that still smell of the plow in memory's nostrils. Here one had heard a blackbird on a hawthorn, there another was taken on summer evenings to eat strawberries and cream and you have seen a waving wheat field on the site of your present residence. The memories of an Edinburgh boy are but partly memories of the town. I look back with delight on many an escalade of garden walls, many a ramble among lilacs full of piping birds, many an exploration in obscure quarters that were neither town nor country, and I think that both for my companions and myself there was a special interest, a point of romance, and a sentiment as of foreign travel when we hit in our excursions on the butt-end of some former hamlet and found a few rustic cottages 
embedded among streets and squares. The tunnel to the Scotland Street Station, the sight of the trains shooting out of its dark maw with the two guards upon the break, the thought of its length and the many ponderous edifices and open thoroughfares above were certainly things of paramount impressiveness to a young mind. It was a subterranean passage, although of a larger bore than we were accustomed to in Ainsworth's novels. And these two words, subterranean passage, were in themselves an irresistible attraction, and seemed to bring us nearer in spirit to the heroes we loved and the black rascals we secretly aspired to imitate. To scale the castle rock from West Prince's Street Gardens and lay a triumphal hand against the rampart itself was to taste a high order of romantic pleasure. And there are other sights and exploits which crowd back upon my mind under a very strong illumination of remembered pleasure. But the effect of not one of them all will compare with the discoverer's joy and the sense of old time and his slow changes on the face of this earth, with which I explored such corners as Cannon Mills or Water Lane or the Nugget of Cottages at Broughton Market. They were more rural than the open country, and gave a greater impression of antiquity than the oldest land upon the high street. They too, like Ferguson's butterfly, had a quaint air of having wandered far from their own place. They looked abashed and homely, with their gables and their creeping plants, their outside stairs, and running mill streams. There were corners that smelt like the end of the country garden where I spent my Aprils, and the people stood to gossip at their doors, as they might have done in Collington or Crammond. In a great measure we may and shall eradicate this haunting flavor of the country. The last elm is dead in Elm Row, and the villas and the workmen's quarters spread apace on all the borders of the city. We can cut down the trees. We can bury the grass under dead paving stones. We can drive brisk streets through all our sleepy quarters. And we may forget the stories in the playgrounds of our boyhood. But we have some possessions that not even the infuriate zeal of builders can utterly abolish and destroy. Nothing can abolish the hills, unless it be a cataclysm of nature which shall subvert Edinburgh Castle itself and lay all her florid structures in the dust. And as long as we have the hills and the firth, we have a famous heritage to leave our children. Our windows, at no expense to us, are most artfully stained to represent a landscape. And when the spring comes round, and the hawthorns begin to flower, and the meadows to smell of young grass, even in the thickest of our streets, the country hilltops find out a young man's eyes and set his heart beating for travel and pure air. And what a lovely spot to end this evening's reading from Edinburgh, Picturesque Notes by Robert Louis Stevenson. I continue to really enjoy this work, and I hope you are too. If you'd like to read it for yourself, as always, you'll find a link to a free ebook from Project Gutenberg in the show description. If you'd like to leave a comment on this change of format, or suggest a boring book you'd like to hear read, 
the best place to catch me is on Twitter at BoringBooksPod, or you can send an email via our website, www.BoringBooksPod.com. I always love hearing from you. I'm so glad you could join me for this evening's reading. Until our next boring book, good night.